Another thing that's happened in the last few days is something called the NFL Draft. Uh, maybe you're familiar with this. If you don't know about football, the draft is where professional football teams choose college players to come and join their team. That's kind of the basic gist of it. And uh, a guy by the name of Robert Griffin III was chosen number two by the Washington Redskins, and this had been built up for months and months and months, and everybody was all excited, and then it was kind of anticlimactic, but for those of us Redskin fans, it was a very exciting moment. And, uh, and so most fans hope that uh, RG3, is his nick, you know, Robert Griffin III, RG3, uh, many of us are hoping that he will be the quarterback for the Washington Redskins for many years to come, because it's been a long time. It's actually been 21 years since the Redskins were in the Super Bowl, and uh, the quarterback that they were in, the, who knows who the quarterback was 21 years ago? <laughs> well, he was a cornerback, and I just saw a tweet from Darrell Green this morning. His son was just drafted in the NFL, and he loves the Lord, Darrell Green. Uh, but no, I believe it was Mark Rippon. Who's heard of Mark Rippon, right? He wasn't exactly a Hall of Fame. The guy before him... Doug Williams, you know, and then in between there, Joe Theismann was a quarterback in the early years. But we haven't had a quarterback that has been winning in this uh, town for a long time. So it's, it's very exciting. Uh, his, his mission and purpose, Robert Griffin III, his mission and purpose is to play quarterback. He was drafted to come and play quarterback, which is arguably the most important position uh, in football, at least uh, on the offense. And can you imagine if he showed up in a couple months? I mean, yeah, he, he's already, he's in Washington right now. But uh, can you imagine if he showed up and he said to the coaches, you know, I'm not too into this quarterback thing. You know, I, I'm not really even sure if I want to play. I'll hang out for a while. You know, maybe we can pass the ball back and forth, but someone else needs to throw it. Not, not too interested in playing quarterback. Well, that would be ridiculous, right? I mean, I, I've never even heard of that. Uh, I guess potentially Tim Tebow was kind of in that conversation because when he was drafted, some people thought he's never going to play quarterback. Maybe he'll play tight end or something. But he certainly wanted to play quarterback. But it would be absolutely ridiculous to RG3 if RG3 showed up and said, you know what, Shanahan's, peace out on that quarterback stuff, man. I'm not really interested. That would be ridiculous. Well, it's, it's equally ridiculous for Christians, followers of Jesus. Okay, Christians are, are followers of Jesus. That's our identity. Uh, you know, the Christian faith isn't about a, a, a place that we're going to. It's about a person that we're following. And it's equally ridiculous for a follower of Jesus to say no to their God-given mission and purpose. We're going to dive into this in the next few weeks. We're going to ta be talking about mission and purpose for a few weeks, a short a kind of mini-series before we launch into the mission of the church study in the book of Acts. But before clarifying our mission and purpose, it's important to understand sifting. It's important to understand sifting. In Luke chapter 22, just before Jesus denied Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus denied Jesus, just before Peter denied Jesus, and uh, he was tortured and then murdered, this is what he said to, to Peter. This is what Jesus said to Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit's blessing upon our time in His Word this morning. Pray together with me. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the Holy Spirit that opens the eyes of our hearts so that we can understand Your Word and not just understand it, but receive it in humility and Honor you by obeying it. And this morning, speak to us, Lord, and give us the leading and guiding and power of your Holy Spirit to hear what you have to say and to respond accordingly. Amen. Now, before Peter, which was not actually his name, right? What, what was Peter's name? Simon, right? His name was Simon. And Jesus, when he met Peter, he said, you know what? He hadn't become the rock yet, but Jesus gave him a new name, and Peter eventually grew into that name through a process called sifting. Before Peter could become that rock, he had to be sifted, or he had to be tested. He had to be proven. 
which made him the leader that he was. Peter was an awesome leader of the church. Uh, you know, he preached powerfully in the book of Acts. We're going to see some of that. And then we have the books of 1 Peter and 2 Peter, in which undoubtedly Peter had become a, a, faith, a rock, really, which was the name that Jesus had, had given to him. And like all Christians who live fruitful lives, who live purposeful lives, who live meaningful lives, every Christian who lives a purposeful, meaningful, fruitful life will go through sifting. It is unavoidable. Several years ago, I was going through a very difficult time. I, I look back and I think, this was really a pivotal season in my life. And what I'm about to say isn't to, be, to say anything negative about other people. But I, I, there were some leaders in, in my life, it, it wasn't here, there were some leaders in my life who were doing some things I disagreed with, and it was just very difficult. And, and maybe, you know, in, for our young people, it could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be a coach, it could be a manager or a supervisor or a co-worker or whatever, that's making some decisions that affect you, and you might see things very differently and disagree with that, and it's, it's, it's painful, it's, it's hard to go through that. And I didn't understand everything that was going on, and it, and it just hurt me pretty deeply. And there was a pivotal moment in my life that happened in my own sifting. In the middle of this difficult time, my pastor, James Sana, I mean, this was such a, a leadership moment, you know, and, and Pastor Son, who I, I just really thank God for, and he understood this process of sifting. You know, I wanted him to say, I wanted him to put his arm around me and say, Ed, everything's going to be okay. Or, you know, I wanted him to say, Ed, I, I got your back, man. I'll, I'll, I'll stand up for you. You know what, we'll, we'll go talk to those guys and I'll, I'll, I got your back, you know. I just wanted some release from the sifting. But what he said was not that at all. He put his arm around me and he said this, Ed, the person whom God wants to use most he breaks the most. He didn't use the word sifted, but you could replace it. The person whom God wants to use most, he sifts, he tests most. He breaks most because it is in our brokenness, it is in my weakness, it is when, when God strips away my pride and my desires and my selfishness and my, 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 that he could replace that with his purposes, and that's going to be true for all of us. Well, Abraham went through some sifting. Abraham, you know, the dude in the Bible, he went through some sifting, and I think part of his story would be very helpful and encouraging to us, and uh, will help us as we seek to join in God's mission and purpose. And so, I want you to see in Hebrews chapter 11, if you have your Bible, you can turn there, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. And we're going to go between Hebrews and what the writer of Hebrews says about Abraham and back and forth between the story in Genesis. Notice what Abraham experienced first. He experienced first a major change. Hebrews 11.8. By faith. Oh, sorry. Let me open my Bible here. Okay. He said this. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as in his, his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, Abraham, when called to go, he was called to go to a place he didn't know where it was. It was a place he had never gone to. God was calling Abraham to make a major change. Now look at what the Bible says about this calling in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we see God calling Abraham to make a major change. Verse 1 of Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. Many of you can relate to this. Many of you, this is a similar story of your family of origin. And so you can relate to in a very real way, to Abraham and his family and this major change that he was calling Abraham to. Verse 2, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. 
when he left Haram. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all of his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed to the land of Canaan. God said, Abram, before he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, he said, Abram, I will let you know what you need to know, when you need to know it. And when you get to the place I'm taking you, I will let you know at that point that you are there. And some of us this morning are in that place where God has either already called us or asked us to make a major change, or He's calling us to make a major change. And it is going to take faith to pass that sifting test. And here's what happens. Here's the way sifting works. God will bring some sifting into our life. He will bring some challenge. He will bring some test into our life. Not to hurt us. Not so that He can bring bad stuff into our life. Not so we just have you know, needless pain or, or discouragement or any of that kind of thing. He gives us the test really to pass it. Uh, students, you, one of the most annoying things of my whole education, which seems like it has absolutely been forever, is when you have professors who give you tests and you do not know exactly what's going to be on that test. The kind of professor, I would say his name, but I don't want him to be seen negatively. I love this man. He was one of my seminary professors. And when I think about him and his wife, I love, I have fond affection for him. But Lord have mercy, not on his class. Because he would say something like this the day before, the week before you're about to have an exam. Of course, like always, some student would say, Dr. So-and-so, uh, can you just give us a heads up? Uh, you know, what, which pages should we pay close attention to? And what would he say? Just know everything. You know, just study everything, and if you know it all, then you'll be fine. And I mean, I'm, most of us in there, we're not jumping up and down. I mean, we would just be frustrated. Now, another professor of mine, my dear mentor, Dr. Mark Meyer, if he ever hears this, you know, he's just a wonderful man. He was the exact opposite, you know. He would tell us exactly what we needed to know. Just know this, pay special attention. You know, he would give these triggers in class, giving the lectures. You might want to star this page, you know, he would say. And we would know exactly what would be on the test. And if you studied, you would get 100 out of 100. You would know exactly. And then you walk out of that, that class knowing exactly what the professor wanted you to know. Isn't it supposed to be that way? If any of you are going to go and teach, and, and teach and do things like that, I know we have at least one teacher in here. Forgive me if this is going against your philosophy. But I would prefer my personal opinion for what it's worth. Let your students know exactly what they're going to be tested on. Teach it to them, and then test them on it. And then that seems to make sense to me. Yes, sir? My teacher just asked everybody, what would you think that's going to be on the That's fabulous. That's good. That's a good philosophy. You're on your way to being a good... But Dr. Dr. Mar, uh, Dr. Kevin. <laughs> One day. Professor Kevin. <laughs> Professor Kevin. Dr. Dahl. That's a ring to it. Anyway, totally lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, God is taking us through the sifting, right? And the way God operates the sifting is he gives you this test. He tells you exactly what you need to know. And if you pass that test, you move on. If you don't pass that test, what happens? What's coming in your life if you don't pass that test? Another test. <laughs> Some more sifting, another test. There's some lessons right now that I'm still learning, and the tests kind of change. You know, I kind of learned a little bit, kind of learned a little bit, and, and the same kind of thing keeps coming, keeps coming, and it's taken me a while. You know, I fought it real hard at first, but now it's like, okay, this is, this is something I need to learn. I'm keeping it, and it, you know, some of the same siftings kind of keep coming back, but God tells me exactly what I need to know, and it takes enormous faith. Faith takes risks. <clears throat> Now, in different cultures, in different places in the world, uh, different personalities, different families, different people uh, respond to risk differently. In the Christian faith, there isn't room to say, my background or my personality doesn't jive with risk. There, there's no place for that. It doesn't matter what personality we have. If you've ever done any study, on the personalities of the greatest leaders of history, maybe American history, world history, different country history, what you'll find is something very interesting. What kind of personality type do you think the great leaders of this uh, world have had? What kind of personalities? 
Anybody done a study on that? What you'll find is very interesting. All personalities. There's no leadership personality that it makes a better leader. Although, it's very interesting, especially if you study World War, World War I and World War II uh, leaders, worldwide leaders, especially on the Allied side of things, you'll see that, generally speaking, the most influential leaders were not high-driving kind of leaders. So my personality, uh, in, at least in the disc, is that I'm a high D, high I. If, the, if any of you know what that is. Um, some of the most influential leaders were low D, and some of them high I. So D is like directive, I is um, influencing. So a lot of times it was high influencing, low directive, and high steadiness. A real steady leader whose emotions didn't go up and down, but who had the, emotion, or the relational capacity to build bridges. I'm not like that. I have, the, I have a high eye, but a high D. I want to get it done last week, not tomorrow. <laughs> you know. And so I tend to have conflict as just part of my personality. I like that. I mean, I kind of thrive in it. Let's get at the table and put gloves on and just box until we're all flat. And then we'll get up and we'll go have a drink together and party, you know. That's just my personality. And that said, there are great leaders that have that, those personalities. But generally, it's the more step, but all different personality types. All different personality types. But it takes risk. That's my point. High risk equals high faith. Just think about the Christian life. I mean, if you're a low risk kind of person, it's going to be hard to see miracles happen in your life. If you're a low-risk kind of person and you get into the business world, it's going to be very unlikely that you'll be successful. There are business leaders that have all different personalities, right? I mean, not everybody's like a Donald Trump. Donald Trump happens to be that high D, you know, DI kind of leader. But there are business leaders all over. But in order to be a very successful business person, High risk, high reward, right? Also, high potential for failure. That's true in the Christian life, right? But not necessarily in the context of failure, but death. <laughs> you know, high risk, yes, you might lose your life, but in that process, you can see some miracles happen in your life. Man, Elder Jeffrey was just over in Israel, and I was there a few years ago. And you walk through this land, you read the Bible, and you see these things that happen. And I mean... Both Old Testament saints and New Testament, whether it be Jesus and the disciples or the early church, I mean, it was high risk, high faith, high miracle. Amazing. Amazing to see these stories of these men and women who were sifted and did amazing things. Hebrews 11.6 earlier in the chapter says, without faith it is impossible to what? Please God. You want to have a, a, a life that is purposeful and fruitful and meaningful. It's going to take high risk, high faith, and high reward. So here's the question. The question, there's a question for each of these points. Will I follow God's leading without knowing where? Abraham didn't know where he was going. God just said, I'll tell you when I get there. Maybe this morning God's going to speak to you about starting something new. And maybe it is a business venture kind of thing. Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe it's a nonprofit kind of organization. And I think the church should be involved in all those kinds of things. Maybe it's some aspect of prayer, gathering people for prayer. Last year, Wilson Wang, he's about to be married, he told some stories about how he and some of his buddies started these prayer meetings in their school. And some of you have started doing that. And you know, you start getting out there around your flagpole, and you start praying, and God's moving you. You have no idea what's going to happen. You know, I remember, you know, Arthur and, and some, some of the guys, you know, a uh, year or even two years ago talking to me about this. And it's like, I have no idea what to do either. They have no idea what to do, but the burden was there. It was birth. God was saying, step out, just do it. And now that slowly began to grow and, and they're starting to really make a difference in their school. And it may start out by God just saying, I'm asking you to make a major change. And it may not make sense. You might not know where. God is going to take that, but God has put it on your heart to go somewhere to do something. Maybe start a Bible study. Maybe it's serving. And maybe there's something that we're not doing. There's a, there's a kind of a, a frustration about the fact that we're not doing something here. And that frustration is God speaking to you about starting something. And maybe if you, if you step out 
and talk to Elder Jeffrey or myself, and, and we begin to see how God's, and we don't even know where it's going to go, but God's laying it on your heart. Maybe it's a conversation you need to have with somebody in your family or a schoolmate or, or a teammate or a co-worker. Conversate, and you know God's laying it on your heart. You've got to have that kind of conversation, but you don't know where that conversation is going to go. And by not having the conversation, it's safer. It's more comfortable. Maybe it's a job change or a move or maybe parents, it's a downsizing that you need to make in order to hold the value in parenting in your home that God wants you to have. But it's risky and you don't know where God may take you if you take those steps. Sifting begins with faith to trust God without knowing where He will lead us and that can be scary. Notice what Abraham uh, experienced next. A delayed promise. A delayed promise. Verses 9 and 10. By faith... He made his home in the promised land. I, I'll read it off here. The, the, this is the NLT. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner. Maybe some of you can relate to that word. He was like a foreigner. Living in tents. Maybe when you came to this country at first, you were living in a tent. Okay, maybe it wasn't a tent, but when you look back at where you're living now and where you were living, it may have felt like a tent. Maybe it was just a, a, an apartment. When Laura and I moved to go to seminary, it was a one-room efficiency. And often days I thought, but it would be better to live in a tent, <laughs> maybe. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Verse 10, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. He lived like a foreigner in the country that God called him to. And of course, many of you can relate to what it feels like to be a foreigner. Every day isn't, isn't a joy-packed, awesome adventure when you're a foreigner in another land. And Laura and I have traveled to a couple different countries. She's actually traveled to more than I have. I thought, because I had studied Hebrew and Aramaic in seminary, that, man, when I went to Israel, I'm just fine. I took the Hebrew Bible, you know. I, I couldn't speak to anyone uh, I couldn't hardly read it because there's no vowel points. You know, in Hebrew, the Bible, they put in the points so you can read it. But over there, there's no vowels. So all you see, those Hebrew words, those are just consonants. And I couldn't figure it out. That didn't help. And man, I felt like a foreigner. And I kind of stick out. Worse yet, I remember being in China and going to this village. And uh, we're walking down the road, our team. And most of the team are Asian American. Like Vince. I mean, if Vince didn't talk, then someone would, if it was me and Vince walking down this village in China, who do you think people would go to? You know, they're going to go to him, even though he may or may not know what in the world people are saying. But Laura and I, I mean, we just stick out like a sore thumb. And I remember walking around, you know, some, you know people just like, whoa. My very first trip in China was in 2001, and we were in the same province that our team was in in 2005. And we went to this place where the, the, the missionary said that um, before they got there, which was recent, uh, they had never seen a foreigner. And uh, you go there, and it just feels weird. Like, I just want to hang out and talk to people and whatever, and I just couldn't, you know, at least without translation. Now, in Genesis chapters 13 and 14, in Genesis 13 and 14, uh, God begins to take Abraham on this journey where there's a promise. There's a son and a son that is promised that's going to be the hope of the world, that's going to bless the whole world. But how old was Abraham when he started making that promise? We read about it in, in chapter 12. He was already 75 when God said, I want you to go from here to there. He's already 75. Notice what he says, a couple of verses here in Genesis 13. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abraham, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. And Jeffrey, you were close to this location. Uh, Masada was close to where this happened. And, and you know, they're on this, the, the, uh, it, there's this thing called the Rift Valley, you know, where the Jordan River comes through and then you have the Dead Sea, this big valley. There's mountains on either side and they come down and it's beautiful. Uh, right across to, to where Jericho is and it's like this desert area but then in the valley it's lush and green and beautiful. Who knows what it was, you know, three, four thousand years ago. But at any rate, they come to this place and, and, and he's saying, just look. Just look in every direction. He's up on top of one of these mountains. Probably can see miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. This is like the whole world, you know, to Abraham. 
as far as you can see, and I'm going to bless you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they can't be counted. I mean, this is a huge promise, but Abraham's an elderly man. So how in the world is this going to happen? Well, God wants, to, wants us to base our lives on promises, not explanations. God, God doesn't owe it to you to explain how he's going to work out all the timing of the next 10 years of your life. God didn't owe it to Abraham to say, okay, Abraham, well, this is how it's going to be mapped out. He just said, Abraham, I am going to bless you, make you a blessing, and so to the point where the dust of the earth, can't even, you can't even count how many people I'm going to bless through you. God wants us to base our lives on promises, not explanations. He loves and he cares about you. He loves and cares. The God of this universe loves and cares about you. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, so on and so forth. He demonstrates His love in this way, even where He has sent Christ to die for us. All these promises about His love. He loves, He cares for you. We read at the beginning, Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, I'll give you rest. That's a promise. You base your life on these promises. Not, I need an explanation, God, before I step out and obey you. No, that isn't the way it works at all. He will guide you. He's promised you. He's good. Over and over and over. In the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, in the historical books, in the prophets, in the, in the Psalms, in Proverbs, the wisdom literature, in the New Testament, all of those genres of literature, all throughout the Bible, you hear the phrase, the Lord is good, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, full of truth. This is our God. This is what He's like. He has an awesome plan for our lives. He wants to use us. He's promised to use us. As a matter of fact, He's placed within us gifts and stewardship so that our lives can be fruitful and meaningful and filled with purpose. But it's not about us. Most, one of the most best-selling books, you know, of, of all time, I think, was, was what? The Purpose Driven Life, right? And if any of you have read The Purpose Driven Life, the first words of that book are... Anybody? Yeah. No, that's not the first words. <laughs> the first words of that book are, it's not about you. Your life. This is, you know, the genius of this, of this paradigm. Is that your life is not about you. And when you make it about you, you're off track. You're off base. You're going to be frustrated. You, you're you're going to be... Um, I'm not going to say your life can't be fruitful, but it will not have the fruitfulness and meaning and purpose as if it, when you live your life for God and His purpose for your life. Sifting breaks us of our selfishness and pride. So the question is, Lord, when? When are you going to bring this relationship? You know, young people, I don't know, probably none of you have ever thought about the opposite sex. I'm sure that doesn't happen um, in, you know, in this setting. And, but at some point you'll think, but Lord, when, when are you going to bring that boy into my life to, to take care of me and to ride me off into the sunset, my, my Prince Charming? Or for you guys, you know, some of you might be thinking it right now. God, when? When, Lord? When are you going to bring that one? Just bring her, one, just bring her Lord, you know. When are, when are you going to heal my marriage, Lord? When, when are you going to give me the job that I deserve? Lord, when are you going to ease the difficulty? This hurts. This is hard for me right now. And when, when this difficulty is out of it, then I'll think about you know, giving and serving and all that kind of thing. But right now, I'm just looking to get out of this difficulty. Maybe it's a, the job that you're looking for. I don't know. So here's the, here's the core question. Will I wait for God's timing without knowing when? You might find yourself right now in the sifting period. And it, that sifting period could end tomorrow. But it might end next week. It might not end until next month. It might be another year. It might be two years. You might be go through a sifting a situation that would be very, very difficult. And it might last for quite a while. So the question is, will, will I wait for God's timing without knowing when? Abraham went from a major change, now a delayed promise, or then a delayed promise, and then now third, an impossible problem. 
Any of you go through a situation right now that you feel like, man, this just feels like an impossible... I, I've been in some of your homes. I've talked to some of you in the last year or two when you when you know parents come up to me and say I, and I have no idea what to do or I'm sitting with someone a young person or a young adult or whoever that just come, I don't know how probably the biggest intro question that most pastors have I have no idea fill in the blank how to get through this when to do this what decision to make what do I do with my kids what do I do with my parents <laughs> you know what do I do with my sibling you know this morning probably all three of my kids thought I have an impossible problem. And his name is Ephraim Emmett or Elijah. And those are siftings in our lives. Notice verse 11, Hebrews 11. It should be Hebrews typo there. And even, uh, and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, she's an old lady. I just saw my grandma 90. This is like my grandma. She was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. It's not about explanations. God explained to you how it's going to work. It's about a promise that he's making to us. An impossible problem. Abraham and Sarah were elderly, but God promised. You may be this, that, or the other thing. Not able to do this. Too much this. Too tall. Too short. Too smart. Too Chinese. You know, too whatever. And God would say to you, no, it's the impossible problems that I'm going to take you through to sift you so that you can live the life that I called you to live. And it will be a fruitful, meaningful, mission-filled life. An impossible problem makes us depend on God like crazy, doesn't it? I remember when I was going through this time and Pastor Son put his arm around me and he said, Ed, it's you know, the people that God breaks that he wants to use most. And I knew, I mean, there was, I had nothing to say. I mean, I, it was that, that was a clear moment for me that you know, God was pressing this into my life. And it was a time where I, had, I could not respond. You know, if I was going to pass this test, I had to now shut it down and say, okay, God. Okay, I'm going to allow these men. I might completely disagree with what they're saying. What you know? What's happening here? But I'm going to submit to this because you're doing something in my life that I don't understand, God. It seems impossible, but it it chiseled me a little bit more in humility. I mean, I wish that that was I was done and I was a real humble guy after that. But you know, I'm still in process. But it chiseled away some pieces that I had to learn to get to this next stage of my life. God made Abram able. Because he trusted God. And maybe you're at a point right now where God's sifting you. And he's a, you're on the precipice of passing the test. And it has to do with faith and trust. If you'll let go a, a little bit more of your life. And embrace more of what God is saying. What he's promising you. There's something on the other side that's not possible by you. But with God. In Genesis 15, we have a big part of the story. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you. I will reward uh, Your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Arguing back and forth you know, with God. And that, that's not wrong. That shows faith. I mean, he's interacting here with God. Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit my wealth. That's strong language. I mean, he's saying, God, since you didn't do this, I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to do this right over here. You ever done, do that with God? Maybe on the way here this morning? Maybe this last week? Maybe you didn't say it out loud to God, but you thought it. I mean, you, you, you thought, okay, God's not doing this, so I'm going over here. I'm going to take matters in my own hands. That's what Abraham's doing here. It's okay. I mean, it's better for us to get those things out. Because at least then we're saying, God, I know you're there. I'm telling you what's up. That's better than not, you know, doing that. And here Abraham is ex expressing faith. But verse 4, then the Lord said to him, no. Maybe God's saying that to you this morning, right now. No. Your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own. Who will be your heir? <laughs> what? Wait a minute, God. Did you see my wife? I mean, she's an old lady. Have you seen me, God? I'm all wrinkly. And it's not working. It's not going to happen. 
Then the Lord took Abram outside. And maybe today, God's going to take you outside and have a little talk with you. Maybe in just a few minutes, He's going to have a talk with you right here in this room. He said, look up in the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed God. He heard God. He, he clearly heard. Oh, the, God is making this promise clear. No, this is my promise over here. God says something to you. You get excited. You believe God. Then it doesn't start. It's not working out your way. See, an impossible problem comes up in your life. An impossible problem. And you can just give, give up and say, oh, okay, plan B. You know. And God may in that moment say, no, I made this promise to you over here. It is an impossible problem. Hang in there. I'm with you to fulfill this promise. And, and Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it as righteousness. Why? Because of his, out loud, because of his faith. Because of his faith. He's going to bless you, not because what you do. God isn't interested in blessing you because you come to church every week. God, I've got the bad. I'm here. Perfect attendance, man. I, I, I serve. I do this. Uh, I do that. Or that. No, God's not blessing people because of what they do. He's blessing people because they trust Him to do what they can't do, but what God can do. So the question is this. Will I expect a miracle without knowing how? And you might be right on a breakthrough, right on the verge of a breakthrough. So last, last the, wrap it up here. This is the journey of Abraham. He goes from a major change. Then there's a delayed promise. That's frustrating. Delay is frustrating. And we know, living in Montgomery County, we understand delay. If you have a pulse and you drive anywhere, you understand that, right? And then an impossible problem, but now the hardest test of all, a senseless tragedy. This is the hardest of all. This, this is very, very difficult for us to get our arms around. There might be some of you, you're going to hear this message, and 5, 10, 15 years down the road, something is going to happen to you, and you're going to have a a real decision to make. It, and it may not be five years. It may be five minutes. It might be five hours from now. I don't know. And it's going to be this major sifting. And how you go through it will determine miracles in your life. Notice what happened. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, when God sifted him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. What? What? Man, that is... I have never read a book that said how to make sense of Abraham killing his son. I mean, I just... That, that, that might sell. That might be a good book. But it just, it's senseless. Even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Your offspring will, will come through this promise. But I want you, God says, I want you to take that son and I want you to offer him to me. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. God calls us to sacrifice, and sometimes it's senseless. It doesn't make sense, and we may never understand it. It might be a dream. Maybe you had a dream at some point, and, and you just saw something, and you had a vision for something, and, and it may be something that God wants you to fulfill and will fulfill, but sometimes God breaks your dream to put in you His dream for your life. He never takes away your dream just to snuff out your dream. That's what Satan likes to do. But God may ask you and call you and break you and sift you out of your dream for your life. Or it might be a good, might be your dream for this church. It might be your dream for your community. It might be a good thing. And God sometimes is going to take that away and snuff that out, but replace it with His dream that's even better. But a lot of people miss it. A lot of people miss it. It might be a career, a job, a pursuit. It might be comfort. It might be health. My, my buddy Nathan, I uh, shared this, haven't talked about it in a while, 31-year-old, massive stroke. And it looks like at this point, this happened I think in December, it looks like at this point he will never have a normal life. He's making great strides. I mean, he's come along. He's walking now, sometimes even without a cane. But it looks like there's massive permanent damage in his life. Never going to, never going to, you know, why? This guy was, man, going gangbusters, influential, doing videos that youth pastors and, and pastors around the world were benefiting from, 
faithful, four kids, had a, had a newborn baby when this happens. It's just senseless. It doesn't make sense. But I've been reading his wife's blog and some friends that are close to him, and God's using it to do some amazing things. So the dream of his life, his parents, his family, his wife, and all their family, gone, sacrificed. That, the dream that they had for their lives will never happen. But God's giving them a new dream now of how, how that's happening. Last week we were at this church planning conference, and this young couple gets up on stage, and the guy's kind of limping. And he gets up there, and he talks about how he had been diagnosed with cancer, uh, cervical cancer. It's, uh, it's uh, what's it called when you can't get over it? Terminal, right? And the doctor just told him, like, the week before, that he has three to six months to live. And, I mean, I don't think there was a dry eye in the place, you know. And he gets up, and God had called them to plant this church, and they just launched the church. I don't know, I mean, it was like a couple months into it. A couple months into this church plant, the church plant's getting started, it's up in Canada. And this man stands up, a young guy, I'm sure, he's several years younger than me. And he just talked about how whether in life or death, they were going to honor Christ, this is what he had called them to. And if, if his life honors God and brings glory to God, he wants to live and pray for the healing. But if in his death, God can be honored and glorified and his church can grow, then so be it. I just thought, wow. I mean, it seems senseless, right? It just seems like it doesn't make sense. God, if you just would heal this man's life, that church could reach people. We have no idea. They have no idea what's going to happen. But God has a right to make any demand on my life that He wishes. And it's our choice not to get bitter when it turns out to be something of a senseless tragedy. It just doesn't make sense. And that's what Abraham was going through. It was his son. I promise to bless through you, Abraham. But now take your son and raise a, a knife and, and, and kill your son. And obviously he was saved. And in that case, didn't have to go through. Thank, thankfully, the, the story ends up really, really good. It didn't have to go down that way. But here's the question. Will I trust God's purpose without knowing why? Will I trust God's purpose without knowing why? So, how is God sifting you? In, in closing, we're gonna. I just want to call you to respond, and I want to challenge you to if if God is speaking to you about one of these tests, that you would write down in your bulletin. And if you don't have a pen, we have some pens over here. You can even get up and 